Sometimes we might have a couple of routers that need to be adjacent to one another, but they're not physically adjacent. The good news is we can set up a GRE tunnel, a generic routing encapsulation tunnel, to make them virtually appear to be adjacent to one another. Hi, my name is Kevin Wallace, and in this video, we're going to take a look at GRE tunnels, beginning with a look at the need for a GRE tunnel. We'll take a look at a configuration on some live gear, and then go through a verification process. And if you'd like to try this lab on your own, in the description of this video, there's a link where you can download a PDF that contains the topology, the base configuration for the routers, the tasks that we're going to be performing, so be sure and download your free PDF from the link in the description below. But to get started, let's consider a situation where we might benefit from a GRE tunnel. Let's say that we have this underlay network. In other words, this is how we have our multi-layer switches or routers physically interconnected but maybe we want to have a very different topology. One thing we could do with GRE tunnels is create tunnels between specific routers or multi-layer switches to make them appear to be adjacent and create a very different overlay network, which is a virtualized network uh, thanks to these tunnels. Now, something to know about a GRE tunnel is that even though it's considered to be a VPN technology, it does not provide security. GRE by itself is not going to do any encryption, which makes it a great companion for IPsec. Because IPsec, which does do encryption and other security features, it can only encapsulate unicast IP packets, while GRE tunnels can encapsulate nearly any type of data. Multicast, broadcast, unicast, non-IP traffic, pretty much anything you can send out of a regular router interface, you can send inside of a GRE tunnel. So what we often do is send our traffic of any type in a GRE tunnel, and those GRE packets, those are unicast IP packets, which we can then send inside of an IPsec tunnel. But in this video, we're concentrating just on the construction of a GRE tunnel. Now let's go out to a live interface and take a look at how we can make a couple of routers that are not physically adjacent appear to be adjacent through a GRE tunnel. Using this topology, let's create a GRE tunnel between routers R1 and R4. Let's imagine that routers R2 and R3 belong to our service provider and we don't have any access to those. But we can make routers R1 and R4 appear to be adjacent. To begin, let's go into global configuration mode on router R1 and let's create a virtual tunnel interface. I'll say interface tunnel, and we can give it a locally significant identifier. I'll just number it tunnel one. And if you take a look at the topology, we see that we want this end of the tunnel to have an IP address of 192.168.1.1 with a 30-bit subnet mask. So we can say IP address 192.168.1.1 and a 30-bit subnet mask is 255.255.255.255. .255 .255 .255 and this tunnel interface is administratively up by default, so there's no need to do a no shutdown. Now I need to say, what is the source of this tunnel from my perspective here on R1, and what's the destination? Now the source could be any of my local interfaces that are up, but it's considered a best practice to use loopback interfaces for the ends of our tunnels, because the loopback interface can stay up as long as the router is up, meaning that if we have more than one path between these routers, even though the interface that's actively carrying our traffic might go down, if there's another path, we can reroute over that other path and the tunnel remains up if we're using our loopback interfaces as the source and destination for the tunnel. So I'm going to say that my tunnel source is interface loopback 0, which we see here has an IP address of 1.1.1.1, .1 .1 .1 .1 .1, and I can point to the tunnel destination, we'll say tunnel destination, and I'm going to specify the IP address of the loopback interface on R4, and that's 4.4.4.4. We'll enter that, and we're done with our configuration on R1. Let's go over to router R4, and we'll give a mirrored configuration. Just like we did on R1, we'll create a virtual tunnel interface, and I'll number it 1. The IP address of this end of the tunnel is 192.168.1.2 with a 30-bit subnet mask. And recall that it is administratively up by default, so I don't have to do a no shutdown. And from the perspective of R4, my tunnel source is going to be my loopback interface. We'll say loopback 0 is the source, and the tunnel destination is going to be the loopback interface of R1, which has an IP address of 1.1.1.1. .1 .1 .1. And we're done with our configuration on R4. 
At this point, our tunnel should be up. Let's confirm that. We can do a show IP interface brief to see what interfaces we have, what IP addresses they have, and if they're up. And here we see we have interface tunnel one with this IP address, and it is in the up, up state. Let's make sure we can reach the other end of this tunnel. We can do a ping to 192.168.1.1. That is successful. But in addition to that, let's make sure that logically we're going just one router hop. We're going directly to R1. It doesn't think we're hopping through R3, then R2, and then to R1. To see what path that we're logically taking, I can do a trace route to 192.168.1.1. And it should be a single router hop, and it is, over to the other end of this Jiri tunnel. And you might have noticed when uh, this tunnel came up, we had an OSPF adjacency come up. Because logically, to OSPF, these two routers, R1 and R4, they appear to be adjacent. They're sending their multicast hellos to one another, and they have formed an adjacency. And we can confirm that with the command show IP OSPF neighbor. And in addition to being a neighbor with router R3 off of Gigabit Ethernet 0 slash 0, we're a neighbor with R1 via our Tunnel 1 interface. And that's a look at how simple it is to create and verify a Jiri tunnel.